beautiful homemakers. We are reading Secrets of Fascinating Womanhood. We are in Chapter 9, Secret Number 6. Enjoy your homemaking. Tuesday night, Angela sat at the dining room table to make up her goal list. After about an hour of thinking, writing, crossing out, and rewriting, she completed it. She felt pleased with herself. Reading the goals and the inspiring messages made her smile and feel good, even excited. She read them through again, and then did as the fascinating womanhood teacher instructed, and imagined herself as having already achieved them. My Goal List 1. Ted is back home with me and loves me, and shares his thoughts with me. He is a wonderful husband. 2. I run three kilometers four times a week and look slim and healthy. I weigh only 53 kilograms. 3. Every day in every way, things get better and better and better. Number 4. I feel peaceful and serene and always speak softly to Ted and the children. I love to smile and sing. 5. I praise and admire Ted and David at every opportunity. Angela smiled again. She folded her list, took it to her bedroom, and put it in her cosmetics case. Angela was late for the Fascinating Womanhood class the following Wednesday evening. She had forgotten that her mother didn't have her car available this night. She only remembered at the last minute that she had to go and pick her mother up to come and stay with the children. Angela was tense from the stress of rushing as she entered the classroom. She slipped into a chair in the back row. Kathy was beginning to share an experience. Kathy, a true experience. My husband and I have always been happily married, but something was missing. I picked at my husband, was the boss, yelled at the children, had a violent temper, managed the finances, and was downright miserable. If this course didn't help, I was going to a psychiatrist. That's now all in the past. I can see no need for a psychiatrist now. My problems with myself are not all solved, but I'm on my way. Thank you, Kathy, said the teacher, smiling. Yes, class, as we learned last week, generally we can heal all our emotional problems by doing just three things. First, forgiving those who have hurt us. Second, repenting of hurts we have caused others. And finally, changing old bad habits with our goal list. Now, Helena, you also have an experience to share with us. Helena, a true experience. Before this course, I thought my husband and myself had a normal marriage. These past weeks, I've been practicing accepting him at face value and making him number one. Two weeks ago, I was served breakfast in bed for the first time in about two years. Last weekend, my husband and I were dancing alone in our living room, when halfway through the dance he looked at me and said, If everyone in the world were just like you, it would be a perfect world. I was left speechless. My husband had never said anything like that to me before. As a matter of fact, before the course, everything I did was wrong, according to my husband. When the course started, to tell you the truth, I kept thinking, why don't they have something for men? They're the ones that need it, not us girls. Now I know that I needed to change. I think we are the happiest married couple in the world now, and we owe it all to fascinating womanhood. Thank you, Helena. That was beautiful. Have you started your love book yet? What a lovely compliment from your husband to write in it. Helena smiled radiantly, her olive skin glowing. Yes, I started my love book this week. Angela made a mental note to also start her love book. She had been meaning to, but kept forgetting. Now, before we learn secret number six, I want you to think carefully about this question. 
What is the most noble and important work in the world? The class was silent. Beth raised her hand. Yes, Beth? I suppose being the leader of a country, a prime minister, or a president. Yes, that is an important job, Beth. But there is a more important one than that. Without this calling being done well, no one can effectively rule any country. Marina raised her hand. Yes, Marina? Are you meaning the rich businessmen and bankers? Supreme Court judges? said Beth. The teacher smiled. The results of the work I am talking about last forever, not just a few decades. Elsie spoke. I think I know what the teacher is getting at. The work of motherhood is the most important work in the world. The teacher beamed, as she often did when she heard the right answer. Thank you, Elsie. Yes, Elsie is right. The calling of motherhood is the most noble and important work in the world, and the most rewarding. We are linking hands with God. We are creating eternal beings, children who will live forever. Yes, we mothers join hands with God as we bring his children into the world. He has given us the great responsibility of training their trusting little minds. Isn't it wonderful? Oh, what other work can even begin to compare? The hand that rocks the cradle rules the world, said Elsie. Yes, indeed. During their young years, and especially during the first three years of our children's lives, their little characters are developing. They look to us, their mothers, for example and guidance. I believe we mothers largely determine what their innocent little spirits will become as adults. Really, we shouldn't complain about men. We women play such a huge part in making them what they are. If we always criticize our sons, they can grow up to be recluses or brutes, even monsters sometimes. But if we praise them, admire them, and be tender with them, they nearly always grow up to be fine, noble men, caring and gentle. Is it easy to be a good mother? No, it's not easy. It takes lots and lots of sacrifice. It means loss of sleep and fatigue at times. And teenagers can be very, very difficult, but it soon passes. They grow up and leave home, all too quickly, don't they, Elsie? Elsie nodded. Yes, but sometimes they come back for a time. Not always a good thing. They appear to revert back to dependent children again. Once they leave home, I feel we should encourage them to remain independent, much as we would love to have them home with us again. Yes, Elsie is right. We must release our children to fly. Sometimes we even need to push them out of the nest like a mother bird does. When they've gone, we look back and think of the sad times and the happy times and our mistakes and our successes. It's a poignant feeling. Who's heard the song from Fiddler on the Roof called Sunrise Sunset? The Jewish milkman sings it as his daughter is about to marry and leave home. The teacher sang a verse in a pure, sweet soprano voice. Is this the little girl I carried? Is this the little girl at play? I don't remember growing older. When did they? Oh, it brings tears to my eyes. It's a beautiful, sweet, sad song. I love that musical. But even though it's sad when our children leave home, there's so much satisfaction when we see our precious children as happy, secure adults, working, marrying, raising their own children. It really is so satisfying. Nothing else in life begins to compare. Yes, being a good mother is a challenge, but it's our greatest source of fulfillment as a woman. Do you not agree, Elsie? I certainly do. And being a grandmother brings it back all over again, and without the sacrifices. My grandchildren bring me so much happiness. Oh, yes, 
our precious grandchildren. How many grandmothers do we have among us? Elsie, Diane, and Marina raised their hands. How wonderful! Elsie, tell us about your grandchildren. Elsie's face lit up. I have eighteen marvelous grandchildren, and I just love them all so much. Every bit as much as my own nine children. They keep me busy when they come to stay, I might add, but young at heart. I feel sorry for women who limit their families to only one or two children. If only they could see ahead and know the joy and the satisfaction that a large, loving family can bring in later life. I know they blame the cost of living, but my husband always earned a low wage, but we managed. I didn't go out to work until my youngest was a teenager, and then only for a few hours a day. And yes, you are right, Harmony. It was only to buy a few luxuries. And you were right, too, about my husband not really wanting me to. Thank you for sharing that with us, Elsie. I'm sure you were a good mother to your large family. I hope I still am. It never really stops, you know. There are always problems coming up that I am able to help them with. Life is never boring with nine children, I can assure you. I know exactly what you mean, Elsie, said the teacher. Now, while we're talking about larger families, we should understand that men respect women who desire to bear children. Even though they themselves may not want more children, they still expect us to desire more children. We should never express regret for becoming pregnant. It can repel and depress a man's love for us. We become degraded as a woman in his eyes. I've raised a large family also, eight children. And yes, I have suffered and sacrificed and made mistakes like we all do. But they seem to have turned out all right. They're not all perfect, but I love them. Then she smiled brightly. And now every year Milton and I are becoming more and more spoilt by all of them. They are all married except our youngest daughter. We've got 21 grandchildren, even more than you, Elsie. Soon it will be 23. And like Elsie, I too love them dearly. You know, I've got so carried away by all this, I've forgotten to give you the secret. You might have already guessed what it is. She turned to the board and wrote, Secret number six. Your God-given role is that of mother and homemaker. Enjoy it. Bev raised her hand. Yes, Bev? Hang on a bit there, teacher. I love being a mother. I always have, especially peeping at my boys when they were little and curled up in bed at night. They look so innocent. But housework? Bev screwed up her nose. Are you telling me I should enjoy housework? Housework is like any other job, Bev. Part pleasant, part not so pleasant. But mostly pleasant, if we're not rushed. And there's always that feeling of satisfaction when a job has been finished and done well. To enjoy our role as women, we need to accept that motherhood and homemaking are our God-given career. Our families really depend on us to fill this role well. We should take a pride in this career and do it well and do it femininely. Most women who don't enjoy motherhood or homemaking are either too rushed for time or are being influenced by media into thinking that managing a home is unfulfilling. Our natural feminine instincts are to enjoy motherhood and homemaking. Nearly all young girls enjoy playing with dolls and doll houses. They love pretending to be moms. But if we're crowded for time, by going out to work or by poor organization, we're robbed of that enjoyment. We should ask ourselves, what am I doing with my time that is more important than my joy in homemaking? Often, 
it's a man's work that is taking up our time. Helena, you had your hand up? Yes. My mother always taught me that we women are happiest being homemakers. I get a lot of happiness from running my household, but only when I do it well. I strongly disagree with all of this, said Beth. You are all beginning to sound like my mother. Homemaking is not for every woman. As you know, I study and work full time. I work in a law office part time. And when I graduate and qualify as a lawyer early next year, I've been offered a full time job with them. I'm having my baby soon, but I'm still going to continue my career after my baby's born. My husband supports my decision. I've put too many years into my career to give up now. The teacher smiled graciously. Thank you for being so honest and sharing your feelings, Beth. I appreciate it. I really do. You feel that all your education will be wasted if you don't carry on with your career. But is our education and experience ever wasted? I trained and worked as a medical nurse before I married, and that experience has helped me and my family and allowed me to help others hundreds and hundreds of times during my life. It still does. And higher education helps to develop our minds so we can continue to educate ourselves in the future. It's never wasted. I even believe we take our mental and spiritual development with us into eternity. I believe our minds live forever. Could I suggest that you be courageous and ask your husband to tell you honestly what he would really prefer you to do? Your child and any future children you bring into the world are going to need a full-time mother more than this world needs another lawyer. Children last forever, Beth. I'm sure the love between you and your husband will also last forever. Can I read to you all the words of a famous lady author that touched me very much? Throughout her long career, this woman, Miss Taylor Caldwell, received all kinds of awards, including the Legion of Honor. But later in life, after three failed marriages, she wrote these words. There is no solid satisfaction in any career for a woman like myself. There is no home, no true freedom, no joy, no expectation for tomorrow, no contentment. I would rather cook a meal for a man and bring him his slippers and feel myself in the protection of his arms than have all the citations and awards I have received worldwide. My property and my bank accounts, they mean nothing to me. And I am only one among the millions of career women like myself. There is nothing there of real value, not from a woman's standpoint, because Fulfillment comes from the feminine role, Miss Taylor Caldwell. Miss Caldwell is right when she says that fulfillment comes from the feminine role. If a woman is to be truly fulfilled, she must succeed in her home. She won't find lasting fulfillment or happiness in the world of men. Our children need to feel that they're more important than their mother's career. They just need us to be there, like the sun in the sky. To our children, a home is just not a home without mother there. Another story that has touched my heart is an account given by a traveling church evangelist, Spitzer Kimball, who flew in early to a city for a missionary meeting that evening. He went to a local minister's family home. The busy minister had to go out, but told the evangelist to make himself at home. So the evangelist settled down in the minister's home and worked for several hours preparing for the evening meeting. Then, mid-afternoon, this experience happened. I will read the evangelist's actual words. It must have been about 3 p.m. The father was out at work. The mother was upstairs ironing. The front door opened a crack, and a child's voice said, Mother? 
I heard the warm, loving voice from upstairs say, I'm up here, dear. Do you want something? Nothing, mother, said the little boy, and he slammed the door and went out to play. In a few minutes, the door opened again. Another boy stepped in, and a little older voice called, Mother? Again, I heard the voice from upstairs say, Here I am, darling. Do you want something? No, was the reply, and the door closed again, and another child went out to play. In a little while, there was still another voice, that of a fifteen-year-old girl. She came rushing in, surprised to find a stranger in the home. She, too, called out, Mother! And to this, the response was again, I'm up here, darling. I'm ironing. That seemed to satisfy the young girl completely, and she went about her piano practice. A little while later, there was a fourth voice, a seventeen-year-old girl's voice. The call upstairs was repeated, and the same mother's voice responded. But she just sat down at the living room table, spread out her books, and began studying. Mother was home. That was the important thing. Here was security. Here was everything the child seemed to need. We will continue with chapter 9 in the next video. Bye.